Welcome back, everybody. That was such a great talk uh, from Sarah Andrus. Uh, it's very important for diet. Um, but I would like to actually introduce our next speaker, Andrea Thurler. She's a family nurse practitioner at Mass General GI and an assistant professor of nursing at Mass General Institute of Health Professions. She's also the director of ambulatory nursing and APPs at Mass General GI Associates. And I will hand it off to her for her talk on uh, hypnotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. Great, thank you so much, Priyanka, and thank you so much to the organizers for having me today for this talk. Um, I'm gonna briefly go through a little bit about um, gut hypnotherapy and talk to you a little bit about cognitive behavioral therapy. So the objectives that I'd like to discuss with you today include defining behavioral health interventions, the application of behavioral health interventions in GI patients, and the future of gut-directed behavioral health interventions. So as you can see here, there's a large overlap between psychology, nutrition, psychiatry, medicine, social work. And some of the things that we look at here in GI specifically in behavioral health include GI functional symptoms, so motility symptoms. Um, we talk with patients who are coping with chronic illness or treatment adherence. We talk about some disordered eating. So just like our previous speaker spoke about, um, disordered eating is something that's really in the forefront of foregut disorders, but also within GI, and then overall health promotion. So clinical hypnosis and cognitive behavioral therapy are what I'm going to focus on today. And there's some upcoming, um, new and upcoming uh, treatment modalities we're doing here in GI. So what is hypnosis? I think many have um, all different perceptions of what it may be, but essentially it's a um, a special mental state where the patient is physically relaxed, but their attention is narrowed. So they're very hyper-focused. And often they'll come to us in GI and be very focused on a symptom that they're dealing with. And we're really trying to target that symptom and maybe other things that may be contributing to stress or anxiety in their life. The um, idea behind hypnosis is the imagination is more vivid and things happen more automatically. So when a patient comes in to see me for hypnosis, we actually are focusing on letting the patient drive and actually me as the um, clinician, I'm actually helping make suggestions to help the patient get to a place where they're a little bit more relaxed and a little less focused on their symptoms. The mind is less critical in hypnosis and more open, and it's not really an unusual state. So one example I give or analogy I give in clinic is if you're leaving your home in the morning and you may be rushing for your commute to work, and for if your commute's like 30 minutes, for example, you may drive by several stores, several trees, several parks, several things along the way, but you don't always remember every single landmark. And um, so in that regard, hypnosis is very similar in the fact that, you know, you're getting from one state of coming in potentially maybe with globus um, sensation or some type of discomfort. And then we're actually bringing you in the hypnotic state into um, a place of relaxation and calmness and wellness, but the patient necess can't necessarily put their finger on what exactly that was that got them there to that relaxation. So what exactly does that mean? Um, there was, there is a focus on really having the patient be in full control and it's very controversial. And um, however, there's agreement among all um, hypnosis practitioners that it's characterized really by this like focused attention, inner absorption, feeling like this disassociation from whatever symptom the patient's presenting with. So in Globus, for example, really trying to get them to less focus on that goal directed. So the patient really has to be open-minded and accepting that they do feel like they can go through these, these sessions. So we usually have about seven sessions, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And the patient has to really be motivated coming into those sessions. And they also have to feel in full control. So your traditional idea of maybe hypnosis um, with you know, a pendulum swinging or whatnot, that is an idea of you being transported to some alternate universe. Um, and that's not what we do in GI. We're actually really giving the patient more control, which oftentimes when they're seeing us is something that they're really missing and really looking to have. So cognitive behavioral therapy um, has a little bit more research behind it, which we'll talk about. And it's a proven short-term intervention for disorders of the gut-brain interaction. So you may hear me say DGBI. 
um, throughout the talk. And that really helps, um, and that really encompasses things like irritable bowel syndrome, functional dyspepsia, constipation, um, globus sensation we treat, functional diarrhea, gastroparesis, among a few. And so what, this, what the DGBI basically looks at and what research has shown is that these CBT strategies can help regulate the brain gut axis. So as you'll see below, there's our lovely dial. And um, one of my colleagues and mentors, Dr. Helen Murray, um, introduced this dial to us in some of our CBT training. And it really does um, highlight how symptoms that patients present uh, to us with, whether it be reflux or heartburn or globus or dysphagia, patients can have those symptoms turn up or turn down depending on um, what anxiety they may have or what um, other situations um, in their life may be going on. So for CBT, patients work with us as behavioral health providers and they learn strategies that they can practice to really turn down, just like you can see in this picture and have the dial more on the one versus the 10. So we often ask, get this question asked when patients are referred to us for behavioral health interventions. And so which patients are appropriate to see us? And so the answer is generally many are appropriate, but I would say just a few exceptions are patients, we like to know if they are working with a psychiatrist or psychologist because they may be on um, a different stage for treatment. So they may need to focus um, on that uh, versus coming to us. And then other patients who really um, are not open to um, some of the CBT or hypnosis approaches, they may not be in a position where they're ready to come see us. Um, so the motivation is another really key piece. Otherwise, our patients oftentimes, especially in motility and patients with neurointestinal health issues, they have run out of options sometimes by the time they've come to see us. So really um, helping them with maladaptive coping behaviors or just really helping them focus on areas that they feel could be improved with their GI symptoms is what makes a appropriate patient for behavioral health. So these are just a few conditions, which I, I have talked about um, in a previous slide, but essentially um, these are some of the areas that we're working on treating patients right now. So for uh, for gut, you know, we have patients with heartburn or globus sensations. We have a new, um, script that um, I've been doing for patients with globus and dysphagia that has been very helpful. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. And um, some of the potential mechanisms that can be helpful for hypnosis. So it can reduce autonomic uh, nervous systems uh, activity. Um, and it may be helpful for motility, but there's not a lot of great evidence behind that. Clinically, we've seen patients just feel a sense of wellness um, from it. But again, there's a lot more research to be done in this area visceral pain sensitivity, which I'll show you a couple studies on that. There's more strong evidence for central mechanisms. So um, normalizing central processing of visceral signals, improving patients' overall um, mood and just the psychological factors and for cognitive changes. And there's some studies out there about um, improvement for immunological effects. And this has um, been seen for some IBD patients and also for um, oncology patients. So we talked about this a little bit, that there's a lot of myths related to um, hypnosis, a lot of misperceptions. So again, really trying to make sure that we're focusing on the patient's symptoms and the patient's control when we're talking about hypnosis. And the hypnosis in itself really draws upon the clinicians and the patients, frankly, creativity. So when patients come to see me, the first thing that we do is we spend um, the first visit, probably the first 20 or so minutes, getting a really good history. Oftentimes it's my colleagues referring, so they have excellent history. So I've done a lot of reading up front on the patient, but then it's interesting what they'll tell me in the visit as to what their like one, two or three major GI concern is that they wanna work on. So what I do is often have the patient um, give me that history and we focus on that. But then when we start our hypnosis sessions, we weave in some of the major symptoms that they present. So subsequent follow-up visits, um, they're usually, usually about six or seven after that first consult. That involves a patient um, giving me about a five minute update on their symptoms and we weave some of those suggestions into the visit. Hypnotic phenomena, they're not magical. They're really just components of everyday experience. So again, just updates on their symptoms so that we can be most helpful. And hypnotizability, it's a stable trait. Um, when they looked at 
uh, how you can tell if someone's hypnotizable, if you will. The telogen absorption scale is something that's been used. Um, and when they looked at the distribution of patients on that scale that were able to be hypnotized, it was a 50-50. But in reality, when they looked at, okay, so these patients are hypnotizable, what about the other 50%? patients still reported uh, improvement in quality of life, which is interesting, even if they weren't in this sort of hypnotizable category. So the relevance is, is questionable here, but um, that's just one way of measuring sort of hypnotizability, if you will. And these are just the phases of hypnosis. Um, so we give a lot of education about it to patients. We do an induction to get the patients into the right mindset a deepening, which often um, goes from a count of one to 20 to get into the session. I mentioned some of the suggestions that we talk about throughout the session. So if someone's really focusing on um, trouble swallowing, and certainly we have a workup, they don't have any um, sort of uh, organic issues that we're dealing with or more dealing with functional, then we can make some suggestions of feeling more calmness, feeling more relaxation, looking at ways to make them feel in control and more confident. And then we also do some post-hypnotic suggestions. So once they're in the state of hypnosis, really getting the patient to feel a little bit more control. And I'll, I'll show you a few examples of that too. Making sure at the end we're re-alerting patients. So as much as we count in, we need to count back out after our session. And again, these sessions um, for GI specific are usually about 15 minutes of actual hypnosis. The beginning is again, focus on a history, the middle part is the hypnosis um, delivery, and then the end is more of a um, follow-up kind of to uh, collect our thoughts and talk a little bit about the session. So this is just another um, slide about just the induction and the suggestions that we tend to use. And I do just wanna jump to show you a couple of the um, suggestions that we, we do here in GI. I'm just gonna move forward just for a second. Um, so these are a couple of the protocols that we use. Um, the one I use mostly is the University of North Carolina protocol. This one is actually based for on IBS, but we've been able to extract, use this as a base and extract a little bit of the um, globus uh, sensation um, suggestions that by Dr. Laura Kiefer to kind of add another level of, um, of benefit for our patients with more foregut issues. And the other one is the Manchester model, which I don't use as much, but the point here is that there are a few different types of scripts that um, providers can use. So there's, these are a few examples. I'll just read one briefly. Um, and so for patients who are just really feeling a decrease of sense of control, that's a lot of the patients, I would say 60 to 70% that I see. Um, you can tell the patient that you can feel confident in your ability to keep strengthening your body's natural resistance to stress and discomfort. You can go into examples if they said, you know, I tried to eat a piece of steak, it got better, and I eat another piece of steak and a slightly bigger piece or a little more quantity. Really weaving that exact language into the suggestions is very helpful, and patients have found it builds their confidence. And this is just another example of um, showing this wave of medication that's spraying down your esophagus, really calming down. Um, the sensations that the patient may feel, giving them this protective coating, um, making them immune to irritation, protecting them from feeling upset inside. All these really positive reinforcement suggestions can be helpful. And so there is some studies that suggest that um, pain can be reduced from hypnosis. There's actually earlier uh, studies done um, in the mid, I think it was around the 1960s, that looked at dentists that were using um, hypnosis for anesthesia for some of their procedures. So I'm not sure anyone here would volunteer for that, but essentially um, pain has been something they've been talking about for a long time with regard to hypnosis. And um, it does carry over a little bit into GI. So um, when we look at what areas of the brain we're focusing on with regard to hypnosis, we're really looking at the prefrontal lobe, which you can see in this picture, which is right in front of the frontal lobe and the anterior cingulate cortex. And these are areas that really focus on a lot of emotions and regulation of patient's behavior. And you'll notice the major difference between mindfulness and hypnosis is that the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex are a little bit decoupled. And that has actually been shown in some of the um, studies looking at functional, um, at looking at the, um, at the brain for hypnosis. Those are the areas that are mainly highlighted. 
And then, um, so a lot of the evidence for hypnosis is rooted in IBS. But again, there's more growing data, which I'll show you in just a minute on um, how much it can be helpful in foregut. There was actually a study done on functional heartburn um, in 2015 that really did find fewer symptoms for those patients. So it doesn't get rid of the stimulus hypnosis, but um, it just changes the threshold of perception. So you're not paying as much attention to those feelings with the same intensity. And that's a quote from John Pandolfino. Um, just briefly, I wanted to talk about um, a study that was done um, in the Royal London Hospital that looked from Glastonovic et al. And it looked at super gastric, gastric belching. And essentially, it showed that patients who had pathological esophageal acid exposure um, at baseline, when they did the CBT um, treatment approach, they actually um, were able to reduce their acid exposure because they were able to reduce the supergastric um, belching because of the CBT treatment, which is really exciting. And just briefly, um, one of my mentors, um, Dr. Mari, she did a um, proof of concept study looking at CBT for rumination syndrome. And as you can see here, the episodes of um, rumination or regurgitation greatly decreased over a three-month period when they were patients were introduced to the um, sessions of CBT. And just to keep a patient in the forefront, as always, I did want to bring everyone's attention to the esophageal hypervigilance um, and anxiety survey. And this is something you can do in your office um, to help understand where patients are with regard to anxiety that may be, may be contributing to their dysphagia symptoms. Um, there was a study done by Taft et al. that showed that esophageal hypervigilance um, and visceral anxiety were actually the strongest predictors for dysphagia severity among patients that underwent um, high-resolution high manometry. So it's just something for us to keep in mind. Um, it's also a really good tool to use pre and post um, cognitive behavioral therapy treatment to see how effective your therapy is. And just really briefly, I'm sorry I'm running short here, I did want to um, highlight, as we're in our advanced practice provider session here, that um, we are actually doing a study right now with IBS patients for CBT, and APPs are leading this work um, with our mentor, Dr. Helen Murray, who's been fabulous, and it's really um, providing CBT for patients. So three of us right now are doing that work um, in GI, and it's another proof of concept study, which is really exciting. So just quickly, um, when we're talking about CBT, we're really testing predictions about what the consequences of a symptom may be for patients to ultimately decrease the worry they have around their symptoms. And repeated exposure to GI sensations essentially will increase or allow the ability for the patient to tolerate their symptoms even more. And um, we talk about physical sensations, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors for patients when they come to us for CBT. And essentially, a patient who may have a symptom of globus may have thoughts of, this is never going to get better, I don't feel well, they may worry, they may end up avoiding doing activities because of that worry, and the consequences, maybe if they avoid activities, they're, you know, limit any embarrassment or concern about having symptoms, but the long term, they may have some more isolated isolation from others. So we just have to map this out for patients so that they can ultimately see how one feeds into the other. And then um, just briefly, when we're doing our education for patients, we're really, again, putting them in the driver's seat. When we go through CBT um, exercises, we allow them to try out different strategies, um, exposures that may be bothering them. So for example, if they have trouble swallowing steak, we might actually have them put that into an exposure that they're gonna do and we evaluate how much that exposure actually contributed or bothered them. Um, and you can see here a, a little model of what we would um, ask a patient to, to capture for us. What symptoms do you anticipate are mildly difficult, moderately difficult, or extremely difficult? We ask them to predict how the difficulty may be. And then once they do it, um, so for example, moderately going to a bar or restaurant with people I don't know and eating and drinking, if dysphagia is an issue for them, it was a 40 um, out of 100, but maybe when they come back to us, they're like, actually, that was only a 15. So again, showing them that they do have control. And so in summary, um, behavioral health interventions, they complement GI medical management. You continue to learn about innovative behavioral health techniques. Patients play a major role in their overall treatment outcome. And I do want to acknowledge um, the organizers, certainly um, Priyanka, 
um, and Alex, um, thank you so much for having me speak. And I do wanna recognize um, my team here, Dr. Mari, Dr. Quo, Dr. Stoller, Dr. Velez, Sam Calabrese, Mary Kate, um, Christina Skarbinski, Maria Grafoni, and the entire advanced practice provider team and nursing team at Mass General. So thank you so much for having me.